Hello, everybody, and hello, everybody out there, and welcome to Jewels of the Soul. Um, this is a special workshop for me, but the, I always start my workshops today by, first of all, wanting to thank you for being here, but secondly, um, <laughs> all right, we know we're going <laughs> to have an issue with this. Okay. But secondly, what I want to say is that I've reached this stage in my life where, um, you know, the older we get, I can't speak for you, but the older I get, the more I feel like um, the jewels of my soul are also what I want to share with everybody. I've, I've been at this teaching for a long, long time. Well, for a long time. Let me edit that. <laughs> but it's true. And after, and, and what, what I have discovered is after a while, um, <laughs> after a while, I, it became important for me to pass on to people what I felt was the most important um, knowledge that I can. And as that became more important to me, and my spiritual life opened up differently, the third thing that kicked in was that as I got into my 60s, I felt a certain level of freedom that said, um, Teach what you've also experienced in, your, in the world behind your eye. Not just what you know, but what you've also experienced in the deeper places of your soul. The place that for many, many decades I've simply kept to myself. So these are the types of currents that have come together to form the workshops that I now offer people. That said, I also want to say this, that I am very much aware that um, money can be returned, but it can never return the time that you're sharing with me, the days of your life that you're giving to me. So when I say that I, I look at each of you with incredible gratitude, and I am, incre I am deeply, deeply mindful that you're giving me days of your life that I cannot give back. So when I sculpt a workshop, it is with the intention of giving you something that can make your life better for the rest of your life, that you can take with you. And that's how I organize my workshops. So I want to thank you for being here. And that's what's behind my um, formation of this workshop. That said, now I'm going to jump into this. Um, you're catching me at a peculiar time. And, and here's what's happening. I'm finishing one book called um, The Power of Holy Language, Prayer, Guidance, and Grace. And it'll be done in a few weeks. And just as I was finishing that, down came the next idea in the way the heavens talk to me. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm organizing what I want to teach in this workshop. And so all of a sudden, all three are competing for agenda in this workshop, for time. And so the good news is all three are, and the bad news is all three are. Because <laughs> what happens with me is that oftentimes when a brand new download of perceptions come in, they can be very greedy and kind of take over and consume my imagination. And so I, I have found a way, I think, to kind of combine. So I'm going to tell you the direction. Because I think what's happening is that I'm going through a stage in my life where all of the many things I've experienced and studied and taught are coming together. 
And so all the tributaries, were, my life is a medical intuitive, my, my work in healing, my, my, my work in mysticism, are all coming together in this moment in time. So I'm going to hit a pause button and talk to you about that I think that we are at one of the most extraordinary, it may be the most extraordinary time in the history of human civilization. And that's a mouthful of words. So I'm going to say it again, the history of human civilization. I think it's a real privilege to be alive now. And I think that what's happening now is going to shift the nature of our species for the rest of the history of humanity. That I don't think that we can afford to um, not truly appreciate that we're alive now and all that that means to the best of our capacity to understand what that means. I <clears throat> so I'm going to say that. Um, I have, for the longest time, been involved, as you know, in health and in healing. And it was health and healing, however, interestingly enough, that led me down a very long path over 30 years, 35 years, into mysticism. Instead of my background in theology, which I would have thought would have kicked in. What opened up my world of mysticism was in fact medical intuition and on trying to understand why the, the nature of the human energy system and more to the point, what makes us sick and eventually asking one question after another, what makes us sick, what makes us, what, how, why don't we want to heal, how can we heal, and eventually, you know, I, I was wondering about where do, where do the choices for our life begin, which brought me into the archetypal realm. And from there I wondered more about, um, is that, what are, what are the choices we make when it comes to the organization of our lives? Do we just drop from trees, or is there a cosmic system that assigns things? I mean, how do we, what's life, what's the organization of life? And those are, those are great big huge questions. They're not ordinary questions. And that's what opened up the next level of my life, which was the study of the mystical life. And it was in that area that led me into a mystical experience with Teresa of Avila, which was a whole nother chapter of my life. And when that happened to me, I thought, um, it was one of those experiences where you, where I felt that my choice of how I wanted to live my life was taken away from me and replaced by a choice that was made for me. And that's a very difficult thing to explain. It's a very difficult thing to explain. And it doesn't make any sense, actually. And I'm going to return to this point again and again and again uh, over the days that we spend together because one of the truths that I think is happening now is that we are at this interesting, critical time in which our consciousness has maxed out as if we, I could compare it to a computer program, I think that our computer program has maxed out 
and we need a pro program that, oh, is that for me? Thank you so much. We need, thank you so very much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, we need a program that um, is more suitable to who we are and what's happening in the world today. And we need to understand all the multiple levels on which we are now operating that is causing, that is generating the multiple levels of changes around us and within us. Now, to say that the world is having a spiritual crisis is a masterpiece of understatement, but that is one way to approach it. There is, if you came to me and had a, a mystical experience, let's say you, you had an experience in which you had a sudden realization, a sudden realization that in fact the animals really understood each other and they communicated. And not only did they communicate, but they communicated with nature. So that the whole way you understood the world was in fact wrong, and now you suddenly, instantly, like an epiphany, had a completely different understanding of the world, just like that, in one second. Now imagine that happens to you, and what happens as a consequence of that is that you'll find that your capacity to explain to people what you've been through is very difficult. Why is it difficult? It's difficult because, first of all, not everybody has these types of epiphany experiences. But the second reason is because our vocabulary is no longer accommodating the types of experiences that we have to the extent codependency. Our vocabulary no longer accommodates the way we've opened up intuitively, the way we've opened up psychically, what we are experiencing with each other. Your capacity to sense the world around you because our vocabulary, we, our vocabulary no longer accommodates what we sense in the world around us, and so we are forced to use words that no longer apply to what we're sensing. We are forced to use therapeutic language for energetic situations, when in fact, therapeutic language assumes that it's a problem when something may not be a problem at all. You may just be perceiving energy. So that this is one level I want to talk about this weekend, is what's the new vocabulary that we need? And that is a jewel in your soul. When you realize, I'm using problem vocabulary for something that might not be a problem. And if I switched my vocabulary, would this still be a problem? Okay? The second thing, the second, third, I don't know what number I'm on. Um, I'm going to talk about holy language, which is the book that I'm finishing, and the role of holy language in our lives, and what I mean by holy language. Um, because what I have um, no, I'll get to that in a second. I'm not done with this. In my work in healing, 
we have, and in your experience with healing, the model that we have worked with forever, forever, is that um, your health begins and ends with you or your genetic pattern, which means your ancestry. I think that, that is not a, that's not a pattern. That pattern now has to be dispelled with. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. Not at all. Because one of the characteristics, and I'm going to work very hard to teach this in the next few days, but I will tell you I have not taught it before, so you are my maiden voyage. is here's what makes this time so incredible. Our consciousness, our mystical awareness is merging with energy consciousness so that the laws of science, physics, are beginning to blend with the truth that mystics have known for a very long time. Now, let's apply that to something that's simply um, what you have discovered and are living within your bio-spiritual ecology. For the last several decades, we have, we have lived within the template that the body, mind, spirit is one system, have we not? We've also started to live this idea that what is, what, is good for, what is good for one has to be good for the whole in my body. So if you came to me and I'm a doctor and, you, and I said to you, you know, your kidneys are shot. I have some medicine here for your kidneys, but actually it's going to blow your heart right out of the body, but who cares? It'll save your kidneys. That's not how we do business anymore. These advertisements you see on TV for these ads for these drugs, you have to be crazy to take them, where they say, you know, take this, and then they go on fast forward. But if you take this and you're pregnant, it's going to blow you yes, you're going to have a heart attack, you're going to do this, you're going to have this, you're going to pass hello. I mean, who would take these medicines? Right. I mean, but at any rate, what the idea is that you want to be treated now as a whole being, agreed? Now, another way to say that is your whole, every organ of your body could be considered its own country, a sovereign nation. What is in one is in the whole. You are a microplanet. You're a microplanet. And the rules of the planet have changed. And the rules of the planet are quite simply that there aren't any sovereign nations anymore. You can have your own territory, but in order for your earth to survive, all the organs have to get along as one system. That's the new psycho-spiritual cosmic dictate. And so what I realized from health coming back to us. So you have to hold on to my tail now, okay? So I'm gonna take you back to doing readings on you. It's taken a long time to actually see that through anatomy of the spirit, where I look through the chakras and the, the tree of life and the Christian sacraments, actually the Catholic sacrament, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera to realize that we are a system of organic divinity. Organic divinity. But we are also governed by the laws of nature. We are a very, we are a natural habitat for the sacred. And as I worked with people about on healing and pursued the subject of why people don't heal than why people do heal, I realized that the mystical laws and the natural laws 
apply to our bio-spiritual health. So here's one. What is in one is in the whole. What is in one is in the whole. In order to heal, that is a law you really have to understand. That's a jewel we're going to go into. That what is in one is in the whole. If you take something that's toxic for one part of your body, it's going to poison all of your body. Agreed? OK. Now let's up that. If you have a negative thought, it's going to poison the whole of your life not just one. You see, it's not just a biochemical. So if you up it again, you realize I actually have to apply that teaching to everything that I believe. So if something I believe causes me to live separated from the whole, I have to get rid of that. Because what is in one is in the whole, which means what I do to you, I'm doing to everybody. So I can no longer afford to believe in a religion that teaches me that I'm better than somebody else. OK, so you got to stick with me on this one, because it's great big huge. One of the things, one of, not things, one of the phenomenon that is happening now is that there is a huge collision of the gods archetypally. And what's breaking down particularly are the Abrahamic teachings. So stick with me on this. This is so big. I want you to look up great big huge into the sky. And you'll see that what is breaking down are the three, this, the half God, half man teachings. The Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, the story of Jesus as the Son of God, and the Holy Prophet. All of these have in common the Abrahamic religions, the idea that God is a man in some way or that the representative of the cosmos on Earth is a male. Now, this is huge to understand that, that the end of this era has come. Now, when I teach theology from this, I need to hit a pause button here and say that I'm just going to introduce that this evening, and we'll be referring to it as we go in. And this is a huge jewel for you to understand, because if you apply this, to sexism and blah, 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 you're going to be missing the point. This is a huge archetypal end of an era of humanity. And it will be expressed in all kinds of, um, it's expressed in the, the, the changing of our sexual patterns. It's expressed in the breakdown of all kinds of things at the physical level. But the issue is that the way in which we will comprehend the nature of God is no longer going to be anthropomorphic. That's the point. Say that again, please. Yes. Yes, I will say it so many times. What's really breaking down is that the way in which we will understand the nature of God will no longer be anthropomorphic. What's really breaking down is this fundamental need in us as human beings to have a God that looks like us. OK, this is so huge if you get this. It's so great big huge. And what it's getting replaced with is a bio-spiritual ecological theology in which we get that all life breathes together. 
And further, here's the great big huge jewel. This is the biggest, hugest jewel. And that's that by healing yourself, you're healing the planet. That what is in one is in the whole. That unless we heal ourselves, we cannot heal the planet. That it is one, in, that we are part of one huge bio, spiritual, ecological system. That the idea that we are separate from anything is, in the Buddha language, the greatest illusion of them all. That we are one huge breathing organism. And that the greatest illusion is that you can see yourself. And this is where one of the, the, <clears throat> the, the uh, oh, God, say this right. Come on, say it right. This is an era of self-imposed suffering unlike anything humanity has ever seen in its history. Self-imposed suffering. It's an epidemic of narcissism. And at its root is this need to be recognized, this need to be important, this need to think that you are just like so extraordinary. We are the only generations who have ever decided that the purpose of life is to be important. For no good reason, mind you. Just because you're born. That in fact you were born for something special, though you don't know what that is, but, you, but it's here somewhere. <laughs> it's got to be in this room, it's here somewhere, I know I just saw it. <laughs> now the thing is, what that has done, this, this pathology to be recognized, to be seen, to be noticed, is exactly the thing that causes a person to, to end up living, making choices to separate one from the whole, which is exactly the source of schizophrenia, bipolar, psychic suffering. It's exactly what causes the break from the whole that you think that being part of the whole is the most humiliating thing in the world when in fact it's the healthiest thing you can do. But somehow, there's this darkness that's been planted that being ordinary is the most contemptible thing in the world. That in fact, being part of the whole in any way, except through vanity projects like fashion, is in fact this horrible thing. That in fact, you have to be recognized and, and independent and isolated, and isolate, in order to be part of the whole. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying in this paradox? So we do, and so that the, the understanding of what the human journey is about and the spiritual journey has in fact gone off the rails a bit. So part of what I want to talk about is that the new model of health that we have to strive for is an understanding that we all breathe together, that what is in one is in the whole, that as we heal ourselves or we serve, no matter what you do as an act of service, you are actually serving the whole, and that there is nothing insignificant, that's that, and that there are jewels of wisdom and truth that we need to begin to live by within us because that is the true call to action that I think um, is the reason why we're all alive at this moment in time. That's what I think. I think that that is this pivotal, pivotal time. Uh, so I, I want to introduce something to put you in a mindset, but. It seems to me 
that you have to remember that there are elements that are happening now that have never, ever, ever come together in the human experience before. And it's becoming commonplace for us that we don't even recognize. I remember years ago when the first time I went to Rome and the taxi cab drove us past the Colosseum and then past the Vatican and, and I'm watching the cab driver and it was like no big deal for him to drive past the Colosseum and no big deal for him to drive past the Vatican. It had become ordinary for him to drive past what for me was one of the most extraordinary things I'd ever seen in my life. So I said to him, you're driving past the Roman Colosseum. Do you not? I, I mean, and he said, oh, that ruin. And I was, <laughs> do you realize what you get used to that you should not get used to? No, 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 really big, huge here. And when you get used to something, it ceases to become an agent of change for you. It ceases to talk to you in the way it should talk to you every single day. Because you've grown accustomed to it and you tell yourself, this is not a big deal. We tell ourselves, for example, it's not a big deal that we live in the nuclear age. That in fact, at any given time, someone could do something awfully foolish with nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. We've grown accustomed to that. And more to the point, you actually think that will never happen. You actually believe that. You've actually told yourself that will never happen. And that's your foolishness. That's your foolishness. People don't make weapons for storage. They make them to use them. But you actually think, I don't even think about it anymore. How can you not think about it? How can you not every day think, oh my God, another day without war? But it's like this. You see how you can just get like into la la land. But you can't get into la la land. And here's another thing. You're the generation, generations, that are about to enter the galactic age, the galactic community. Now that is such a big deal. And I'm, I'm, I'm giving you these coordinates because these are the coordinates that are actually shifting your life around you and within you more than you realize. Because by entering the galactic age, that is part of what is making the religions obsolete. And while you may not even think about that, the fact is all the religious mythologies are becoming obsolete because they're all Earth-centric. And they all assume God looks like us. And God's from here or there or Israel or here or there. And that the whole cosmos is run by something born on this planet. What could be more preposterous? Okay, and now comes the great epiphany. Oh my God, how preposterous is that? And where do you go now, one? when you realize, I've been believing something preposterous. Where do you go then? What are you going to believe then? The next level of theology cannot contain an image of God that looks like us. It has to contain the idea that I think this universe is a mechanistic place. where there isn't a God figure, but light consciousness. A lot of people will not be able to make that leap. It's going to be too much, but 
part of what's happening in our world is that those mythologies are getting dismantled and they're not going to go down without a fight. They're not going down without a fight. This is an incredible time to be alive. So I have to put, I have to put something on. This is the slipperiest stage I've ever been on. OK. <laughs> OK. I'm going to draw something to help, help you out. How many of you, I know I see so many familiar faces, but who has not been with me before? Ooh. OK. So in person. OK. All right. I'm going to draw something. And those who have been with me before, you've seen me do this. But it's really essential. So I'm going to put a template in your head. And I, I, you're, I'll also tell all of you that my drawings are minimal. And you'll be very glad about that. Because I'm many things. An artist is not one of them. But this is something that you'll use the rest of your life. OK? Here's the building. OK. Now, the th here, wait. I want you to start thinking like this, and I'm going to refer to it several times through our time together. Um, years ago, very briefly, I was visiting a friend in New York, and she did live on the penthouse of this apartment building. It was a hot August day. And in New York, on hot August days, the streets are loud. I just adore New York City, but it can be loud. And cab drivers, you know this, and they have the, they don't usually have the, I mean, they don't have alleys, so a lot of trash piles up on the street. And this is what happened. When I went into the first floor, you could, you could, the street was crowded and loud and et cetera. But when I got to her penthouse, I couldn't hear the traffic that much. The air smelled differently. And it occurred to me as I looked from her uh, balcony, and she had these two little seats and, and, and all these flowers, because it was her version of Central Park, and that if, and I could see the Hudson River in New Jersey, and <laughs> um, that if I, had spoken to someone in this first floor who never left that area and said, do you know you live right next to, like, there's a beautiful Central Park, and there's a beautiful river, the Hudson, and described it, that person could tell me I was crazy. That this person could rightly say, that I don't live next to a river. I don't live next to a park. There's no bridge, nothing. But the view up here was stunning. And it's the same address. Now, I want you to think of yourself as being this building. That once you're born, your structure is in place. So from the moment you are you, all the movement for you is inside your building. And every time you go up a level in you, you'll see your whole reality differently. But every time you go up, it's going to be more expensive. Reality is not cheap. So every time you move up, every single time, you're going to look at the world differently. And here's what's true. Nobody down here is interested in the view from your floor. So if you come down here and you try to say, for the first time, if you get up to a floor, and for the very first time, you see Central Park. You can't see it from this floor, but you can from this one. And you come down here and say, you just won't believe it. We actually really do live right next to this gorgeous park and blah, 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 blah. Don't expect everybody else to appreciate what you've suddenly discovered you understand. Your consciousness is your business. And your understanding is your business. But what is true is what you do. Your consciousness is not about you telling everybody what you see. It's about 
how you inspire them and letting them wonder what changed you. You become the greater mystery. It's like something, you, your job is to inspire others by the person you're becoming because of what you see. So now you see Central Park and you decide to become a naturalist or an environmentalist because you didn't realize the park was there. And so they start wondering, what's gotten into you? Your job is to inspire people, not lecture them with, with all of a sudden your, do you understand the difference? Because you don't take instructions that way, do you? Okay, so always think about talking to yourself when you talk to others. But here's what's true. This, this journey up this building reaches this. The lower floors are very personal. The upper floors are very impersonal. Very impersonal. And it's the difference, and this journey is going to make all the difference in the world. That one of the jewels of your, that you can give yourself is to learn how to not take your own life personally. And it's one of the greatest ways to heal codependence. It's one of the greatest ways to heal anything is to learn how to look at everything in your life completely impersonally. Because none of this life was set up for you. You're here for a very brief period of time, and then you will be gone. If you want, organize your own funeral and imagine who's going to show up. And then realize that the next day they're going to get on with their life and they'll be just fine, except for a couple of people. There's none of us that is that important. So let's put our lives into perspective and realize most of us have less years ahead of us than behind us. And so the idea of getting very impersonal about our lives there may be some wisdom in it. And what it does is it helps you to shed the skin of what you're holding on to, of what you need to get rid of, of what's just not important and what is important and how to see clearly. Okay. But this little transition from the personal to the impersonal can take years. However, however, it's the person that can make that that will heal the best and the fastest. I, I wish, you know, that in writing a book about why people don't heal now and in and, and diagnoses, I think what should be said in a diagnostic book, is that this person, part of the reason this person is ill is because they take everything personally. And that really does qualify as a social disorder or a level of emotional toxicity that is more destructive than you can possibly imagine. Because there's nothing personal Nothing personal at all. The only thing personal is your clothing. And then, and as you get into understanding this scale, you can, be, you can apply the nature of God to this. That the God below, and this is important, is going to be a personal God for you. You're going to need a personal God, you know, Christmas or bar mitzvah, a God that maybe looks like you, a God that's a daddy or off planet, a father figure or whatever it is you need, a God, goddess, who knows how you talk. But in the transition, the nature of the divine becomes impersonal. 
totally impersonal. The, the God that has nothing to, that, that can transition to the next galaxy. The God that created this whole universe. That is not limited to, you know, born in, in Bethlehem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are great stories. They're wonderful. They make for great stories and great gifts. But that is not the story of eternal truth. There are eternal truths that were taught to this person. OK. So and it's hard to make that transition. But, but part of what is happening now is that transition is being made. So are we doing OK here? Is this too much on a first night journey? Good. OK. How are we doing? OK. All right. We just, OK. But I have to also add this. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to understand that it, the shift that we're going through that's awakening in you and around you includes how much you are physically changing yourself, how much you're awakening. That in fact, what we'll start with is um, what is going on in you, around you, and through you? That in fact, if you really get this idea of as you heal yourself, you heal your, the whole, that includes understanding that I need to understand my stresses very differently that you need to think of yourself as part of a collective that also is picking up all the stress, that you're picking up psychic free radicals from the whole, that you, we need to have a very different understanding of our health now that includes this idea of our energy anatomy system not just our physical. My physical anatomy system is mine to manage so that I'm in charge, obviously, of what I put in my body. But my energetic anatomy system is macro, and my body is my micro. So that my energetic anatomy system is part of the collective. And so how do we manage our collective energetic anatomy system? And this is something you, we need to talk about in great detail. And this will be one of the jewels of your soul that I, that I want you to go home with, which is the idea that while you have become accustomed to thinking in terms of your electromagnetic, maybe in, of your energy, you may use the word energy every now and again, but you don't ever think about, I'll bet you, your energy health in a full-time way. You don't take care of yourself as an energy being as well as a physical being. You don't think of yourself as, as what thought forms, what attitudes are really toxic for me. What do I look like as an energy being? Because this is what you look like. You don't think about yourself as actually hemorrhaging energy or making decisions that cause you to hemorrhage energy. And if, in fact, you have been gutted and you're hemorrhaging energy, what does that make you, like the law of magnetic attraction, do you magnetically attract psychic free radicals to yourself from the whole? And do they come in, and do you feel like, I feel so heavy today? Is that your energy alone, or have you collected the energy of other people? Can you tell the difference? And if so, how do you dispel it? OK, we have got to start thinking of our health as being a part of the collective. And so we also have to start thinking of our healing practices 
as being part of the collective. What is in one is in the whole. We can no longer think of ourselves as being independent entities that just visit the whole on occasion, which is how we've been living up to this point. Do you see what I mean? If you understand that all life breathes together, it's like when, when, when years ago when I started to teach intuition, and people would talk to me about wanting to be intuitive readers and et cetera, which is wonderful. But I also knew that the challenge for so many people is that they thought they could just turn on their intuition on and off, that it was a profession and that they can just, you know, decide who they want to do a reading for and who they don't want to do. And, and they didn't understand the nature of your intuitive system and how perception works. And it's, and it's also something that because you were not taught, how, how does your intuitive system work? How do you perceive, how does your energy sensory system work? And what do you do with the data that you pick up? How do you process it? How does your intellectual system process it? Okay. And, and um, this is something I'd like to talk about tomorrow, which is you are an intuitive being, but do you actually treat yourself that way? Or do you, most people still retreat into their intellect when in fact they're getting intuitive data. So there's a lot going on, but I, let me just close down our session this evening by saying, I want to reiterate that I think this is a very exciting time to be alive. A privilege, and you know how when people do that game, they'll say, you know, if you could live at any other time, when would you want to live? And always people will say, oh, I'd like to see when the pyramids were made, or I'd like to, I'd like to go see, you know, maybe the time when Jesus was alive, or Buddha, or they always pick these big figures, right? But if it were up to me, I would go forward. I'd go forward a, a, a hundred years. And I would want to see how historians wrote about this time and how they wrote about how we navigated this time in history because it is like no other time. It is like no other time. We, we are confronting the great challenge of becoming a global community. And that challenge is somehow in every one of our lives. And we are witnessing that challenge reshaping our planet. And the, we're witnessing theologies falling apart and not being replaced by anything yet. We're witnessing societies uncertain of how to progress in terms of their values. For the first time ever, we're witnessing a world in a crisis of faith and trust and a rise of madness. Okay, and, and by the way, this is not a political statement. I don't mean it that way at all, and if you hear it that way, you're not hearing it. You're down here. I am talking at what happens between archetypal ages, when in fact, the structure we're used to holding on is gone, and it hasn't been replaced. And we haven't yet articulated what is it we believe. And because we've individuated so much, there's no place people go anymore to gather and say, what do we believe together? What do we believe? Do we know what we believe together? Nobody talks about that. That's part of what the crisis is. 
There's no agreed upon values. There's no agreed upon nature of God. There's no agreed upon anything. There's a friend who lives here. I don't know him yet, but I have his manuscript. He lives near here, not far. And he sent me his book. And it's called, Tip for Review, and it's called The Way of the Rose. Isn't that a beautiful title? He's a Buddhist. And he had an apparition of Mary. How did that happen, right? Well, it couldn't be more perfect. And she said to do a book on her rosary, which she calls the way of the rose. And she says, come into my rose garden. Now he goes, and so he, he did exactly what she said. And now he starts prayer circles with the rosary, not as Catholic, but as the Madonna, and she says, come into the garden, tell me, tell me what it is I can help you with. And so people gather together to say the rosary. And what they do is they share with each other, I need prayers for my family. I need prayers for this. And then as a group, they all say the rosary. And then they go home. But they generate this little field of grace. Now this is going to be the new way of prayer, of finding our way through the darkness, of finding our way to how do we make this transition to the next level of grace? How do we do that? How do we do that? Because that's where we're going. And that, that is what's making this time so vulnerable for us which is we, we, we have to figure out, we have to realize that what's happening in this world is that it really isn't a, fa a crisis of what, do we, what is it we trust, who do we trust? The trust mechanism is malfunctioning in people. Nobody shows up at a business meeting without 16 lawyers because they assume the person sitting across from them is going to lie to them. Who can live like this, but this is how we're living? Is it any wonder we're going mad? Is it any wonder our stress and anxiety? How many people are medicated for anxiety, for stress? This is life? No, we're, we're obviously not doing something right. OK? And what's missing is we don't have this sense at all that we trust each other. We don't have a sense of that inner, inner hope, guidance, trust. We just don't. So I'm going to talk to you a lot about that over the next couple of days. I wish we had a month together. but. We're going to do our best to put that in order. These are the jewels of the soul for me to know what it is you believe. So anyway, I thought that I would also um, share a prayer that I wrote from my book. Was that, would you mind if I did that? I, um, it, it's, let me just add something here. It, I never thought in the whole of my life I would ever write a book on prayer because it reminds me of being a nun, and anything that reminds me of being a nun is something I go the other way, but here I am. And, and, I, and I suffer from post-traumatic prayer syndrome, <laughs> which, no, it's the truth. It's the truth, because years and years ago, when I was doing a workshop, and I thought, it seemed like you know, people, when I was first getting into the workshop business, people were sort of, um, they would start their workshop with a quiet moment, and I thought, well, that's pretty all right. And I thought, well, I'd start with a prayer. And somebody in my audience stood up, and this hostile, dragon-like person said, I didn't come here to pray, but it was so hostile. And, then, and, and I was waiting for someone to stand up and say, well, I did. This is a class on spirituality. <laughs> but everybody was like, neither did I. And I thought, is this is a class on spirituality. I mean. I just shut it down. And it wasn't until two decades later when I had Teresa 
and I had to um, talk about entering the castle. And an audience of 850 people that I brought a prayer again. And, and everybody wanted to go into the castle because I made it sound like going into a, you know, like, whew. and 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 so, and Teresa said, you can't go into the soul without prayer. So I said, um, I told the audience that, and I said, so that means I have to lead you in a prayer. And they're like, all right, 850 people. No one left. And I'm telling you, I don't get nervous in front of an audience, but I was like shaking. And at the end of that, it was so quiet and so beautiful in this room. And then I had to sign books. And this woman came up to me from behind. And she leans over me and she said, I've been in pain 20 years, arthritis. I thought you'd want to know. I'm not in pain anymore. Thank you so much. And she walked out, never saw her face. And every place I went on that book tour was entering the castle, there was a healing. I'm talking big, huge healing. And then I did workshops on healing, and that's what opened the door for me to wonder, what is healing? What is grace? How? And that's what opened it up. And that ultimately led to my finally doing this book on prayer. So I'm, I'll just, <laughs> it took me a long time, long, long time. <clears throat> so the idea was that I would write a prayer and then add guidance and then a little bit on grace. So that is, that was my approach here. Okay. So I'm going to read this to you. And my version of prayer is that I don't pray like, um, I just talk. It's like holy conversation is what, how I describe it. And it works for me. And I think that's, the way heaven works is holy conversation. So this is what I'll share with you. And I don't know how you listen, if it's better for you to keep your eyes closed or open. So I'm going to read it. And afterwards, I'll share the guidance and then the grace part. Is that good? And this prayer is called, how will you come to me, Lord? How will you come to me, Lord? How will I know you? How will I recognize you? I know you will come for me. You'll slip into my being, perhaps in the middle of the night while I sleep. Maybe you'll come for me when I'm not looking for you, when I'm distracted, staring into an oncoming storm, fearing for my immortality. Or maybe you'll come for me in the midst of a tiny lie that pours out of my mouth effortlessly. You will let me know you're listening as I listen to myself say something that's not true as easily as if I were giving the time of day. I tell myself those small lies are insignificant, that they don't matter. How do I know what matters? How can I tell what's significant in my life? What if I'm being tested or observed? Could I have anesthetized a part of my conscience years ago, and it is you who are reawakening it now? Maybe that is how you'll come to me. You'll rouse my conscience out of its resting position like a sleeping dragon one day when I'm weakened by disease or fear or loneliness. And I'll be forced to face the truth that I fear the many expressions of you. Most of all, the light of truth. I fear truth, your truth itself, and I fear the power rumbles like an earthquake through my being each time my eyes look into the eyes of another human being. One word of truth exchanged through the soul portal of another is enough to bond two human beings for eternity. A sacred union is formed. No wonder we fear truth, and yet we're compelled to seek truth with every breath we take. We fear you and cannot stop searching for you, Lord. You come. You'll come through me, to me, through some truth, and I will need to survive a calamity, perhaps. You'll make me need you, and I will come searching. You'll make me shed my skin like a snake peeling out of a worn-out uniform. 
My illusions, my flaws will be exposed like boils ready for a lance. And then when I'm broken, too weak to deceive even myself, there you will be already resurrecting my soul. The truth is each of us longs for some sign that heaven is watching, observing, overseeing the journey of our life. We look for signs of God's presence in the subtle moments and the movements of our lives as we search for meaning and purpose in all that we do. Though we may deny at times that we're searching for God, instead saying that we're seeking meaning and purpose, we are still admitting that we cannot bear the emptiness that comes from imagining that our lives are unthreaded to a sacred source. And so we wonder how, when, and in what way the divine will come into our lives. We fear that visit as much as we search for it because deep in our soul we know that that holy encounter is inevitable. Grace. Lord, grant me the grace of faith, faith in the presence and power of you in my life. I admit to you that in this quiet moment that having faith in all matters as they unfold in my life is so difficult at times. I struggle with seeing how to follow that candle in a dark night, especially when I'm in the midst of chaos. And yet I've learned that chaos is your miracle atmosphere, spinning with the ingredients through which you work wonders. When faith is present in me, Lord, I dwell in miracles. Amen. So I shall leave you with that, and I thank you, and I'm going to send you on, our, on your way for this evening off to a wonderful dinner. I thank you for joining um, out there. And uh, let's go have a lovely evening together. Thank you.